Today is going to be all about Z, and there are way too many 3D printers on this table. Hello everybody, Chris here, and yes, today is going to be all about the Z axis. And there's a couple of different ways to achieve your Z motion, but the most common you see on a hobby-based 3D printer is with a lead screw. And I do get a lot of questions about this setup. Should I use two lead screws? Can I use multiple drivers? Can I use software to compensate for some of the shortcomings? So we're gonna go over all that stuff today and look at quite a few different configurations. And I have five 3D printers here and they all do Z just a little bit differently. Now there's also a lot of information available on the actual screw itself. How many starts and how much does it move per rotation? I do have a video for that, I'll leave a link to that in the description, but today is pretty much just all about configurations and how you can change them up on your 3D printer to best suit your needs. So let's get started with probably the most common setup on the Ender 3 with just a single lead screw. And here we have the Ender 3. You know it, you love it, but it only has a single Z lead screw stock. There are a couple different types of Ender 3, but this is the base model. Now you'll notice over here I have a printed part instead of a PSU. Normally your power supply would be over there. This one goes inside my enclosure, so I just unplugged it, took it out so I could show you this. But you just have one Z lead screw over here. This is a TR 8x8 four start lead screw, so a pretty aggressive pitch. And this is a very common setup to see on a more affordable 3D printer like the Ender 3. Now this setup does work just fine, only driving it from one side of the gantry. Now, the longer the gantry is, maybe the more problems you'll see, but this one is relatively short. This is also the same way they did the CR-10, and it does suffer for a few more problems because it is quite a bit bigger than the Ender-3. But the problem that you can see when only having a single lead screw is sometimes this side will droop a bit. Now, on a printer like this with V-wheels on extrusion, you can get these adjusted to minimize that effect greatly, Plus, you're going to be able to adjust the bed up to compensate for any side-to-side -side slop. So if the non-lead screw side, if this side was a little bit lower, lead screw side's a little bit higher, you're going to compensate that by leveling your bed. So most of the time, it's not a big deal. Now, the one issue I do see on occasion that does cause a problem is the fact that there's too much slop on this side. This side will move faster than this side. So as an example, when you start out your print, you're moving in very small increments. If you're at 0.2 layer height, you're only moving two tenths of a millimeter at a time. You might run into the issue where you have to take a couple of steps on this side before this side starts moving. And that's where the printer design and the wheel adjustments come in to keep that from happening. But that's the most common single lead screw issue on a 3D printer that I usually see. The easiest way to detect that is to put some marks on the wheels over here, run the gantry up manually a couple of steps, and make sure you see these wheels move with every step of your Z lead screw. If it doesn't, adjust both sides wheels correctly, make sure your lead screw is tight on the shaft, everything's all tightened up ready to go, and hopefully that will get you moving at the same rate on both sides of this gantry. Again, if there's any droop, that is taken up by adjusting the bed. It's also important to mention that they do sell kits for Ender 3s and CR10s and a lot of other printers to add a second lead screw. You just add the motor over here, you have to move your PSU, but then you hook them up in series and you're still only using one plug on the main board. You just come into this motor first and then head over to that motor. But that would get you to a two lead screw design if you wish. We'll talk more about how those are set up in, later in the video. Now we'll move on to Log. Log is in a standard Marlin configuration right now. Nothing fancy done as far as the lead screws are concerned. But these have integrated lead screws, but it is dual. It's more about the number of lead screws than it is about what type. Now the problem with this scenario, you can actually see it in the video right here. When you have two lead screws and you turn them off, the power goes off, one side could droop over the other because they're not synchronized in any way. So you can see in this video, this side is much higher than this side. And when the power's off, you can turn these independently, freely, and that can definitely get it out of whack. And you want your gantry, this x-axis, to be as perpendicular to the bed as possible. That's how you're gonna get the best print results. 
So having two lead screws on the printer, if you wanted to add one to your single lead screw machine, isn't going to necessarily fix everything. But there's a couple of ways to get around this. First, you can do it with hardware. And that's what Artillery has done here with the Genius. We'll take a look at its lead screw setup. The Genius does have two Z motors, and they are individually driven. They have their own driver. We're going to take a look at that more in a little bit. There might be software on this that helps you align them. But most of what I wanted to show you is this belt up here on the top. In this configuration, both of the Z screws have a gear on top, and they're synchronized by a closed loop belt. And this will keep them from drooping one side or the other, like we saw on Log, where they're both independent, because they have to turn at the same rate. Now the only problem I see with this is that you have to find a belt that will fit your configuration, which might not be all that easy, and they have to be synchronized in the first place. So before you put the belt on, you will have to get that gantry level, then tighten up your gear to make sure it stays that way. But after that's been adjusted, this should keep them synchronized going forward. So that's not a bad solution. And on Thingiverse, you can find a lot of different configurations for other 3D printers that will help you get this done if this is the route you want to go in. Also, if you're going to connect your Z screws with a belt, make sure that those screws are absolutely straight because keeping them captive at all on the top could cause banding if they're not 100% right on the money. And you wouldn't even have to have two Z motors for this configuration. You can have some sort of idler over here that would keep them synchronized. One motor should be able to power them, even if you have a belt on top. Not all NEMA 17s are created equal, but most of the motors that you're going to find on a printer should be able to do that work. And then we come to our Anycubic Mega S, and it has yet another configuration to be able to deal with dual lead screws. So let's take a look at the back. This style uses two Z motors and two lead screws on a single motor driver, but they've put in two end stops, one on each side, so that you can home hit both of these end stops so it knows when the gantry is level. And there's a screw on both sides of the X axis to adjust the height. So if your X isn't quite level, you can adjust that screw, make them hit that end stop on left or right sooner or later to get it adjusted in. And let's just run through the sequence real quick so I can show you what it does and try to ignore the really noisy case fan, but we're just going to home Z. You can see it brings it down. It's going to touch one end stop and then the other. Now it knows that the gantry is level. So this setup takes a little bit more hardware and there is a little bit of firmware tweaking you have to do. We can take a look at that, but it is a pretty good setup in my opinion just adding a second end stop switch. And then you have one more adjustment point, not just the bed, if things are skewed just a bit. So there's a look at the more common hardware configurations you're gonna see and how to resolve that two lead screw issue. But there's also gonna be an electronics piece for the most part, based on what board you have and what drivers you use. So let's go over that for just a little bit. So here's a Creality style board. This is the kind of board that you're going to see on that Ender 3 that we looked at. Notice there are only four driver chips, and they're baked in, you can't replace them, and there are four motor wire plugs. You only have an option for one Z motor, one Z driver. And that's where that motor cable in series comes in. You can run the cable out to one Z motor, then run another extension cable over to the other Z motor. And you do see kits a lot that allow this if you're going to add that additional Z. And I didn't have one of those cables handy to show you, but this is what it would look like if you bought one of these kits. You could use the stock board and then use this cable to run to both motors, and you only have one plug that goes in that existing driver port. And there's multiple solutions to get around this, like these little PCBs right here. This one will allow you to plug in both of your Z motors and then have one cable broke out to go to your main board. Again, these are hooked in series, it's not very common for you to see a parallel setup. So there's a couple things you can do to get around that scenario. And then we take a look at something like an SKR 1.3. You have the same type of setup as we did on the Creality board. You only have one Z driver and one Z plug. The only difference, on a lot of boards you see drivers available for multiple extruders. And that's how this setup is configured. You have an E0 and an E1. 
Now, if you have an additional driver to put on this board, you just fill this slot here, you can configure the firmware to have a Z motor on this driver and a Z motor on this driver. And that's all set up based on the firmware, and we'll go over that. But that would be your other option on something like a 1.3 board. Or you could use one of those kits or something like this PCB to have your two Zs connected in series. So there's another way around it. And then we have something like the SKR 1.4. We still have the same five driver slots, so you're able to do pretty much any configuration you wish. But we have two Z ports. These are also hooked up in series. So you can hook up both your Z motors. They will be ran off the same driver, so they're gonna do the identical movement side by side. Or you can hook up one to your Z and one to your E1, and then configure it in firmware. So there's a couple of different ways you can go if you want to use two Z motors. You can split them off with a plug like I showed you. You could use two end stops to try to keep them synchronized a bit, or you could even connect them with a belt. But there's also a lot of firmware configuration with some of these other options, considering using an additional driver module on that other Z motor. And there's also a few tricky things inside the firmware that can help with this. So that's what we're going to take a look at now. And before we get started jumping into Marlin and taking a look at firmware settings, let's take a look at the good old Prusa Mark III. They handle this scenario with firmware as well. Now the Mark III has a 2130 driver on it. Now both Z motors share the same driver. So you're in the scenario where you could have one motor fall, so the gantry would not be level. And Prusa uses holding current on their Z motors all the time to keep them from falling while the printer is powered on. It also has a Z probe, that will automatically do a Z align if it sees something's been skewed. So they're combating these issues with firmware. And that's not a bad way to go. So when you first configure your Prusa machine, you go through a Z calibration. It's going to home the machine. It's going to take the Z all the way to the top and assume that this frame is rigid. It's going to bottom out both sides of the Z on the top. That gets them aligned with the frame. Then it comes down and does a 9.Z level. And if that probe detects anything suspicious, it can make compensations for it or repeat this process. Now let's just say we turn the power off and we make a Z screw adjustment. Maybe you were moving it around and something happened. Well, when we kick it back on and say you started your print in the Prusa slicer, they always include an auto level for the G29 or in Prusa it is G80, but Let's just simulate that by running an auto level. By the time it gets all the way to the third probe, it's already noticed that there's something wrong. It says Z leveling will be enforced. You can hit the button. It's going to take it all the way to the top, sync it again with that frame, and then get back to leveling, and you'll be right back in good shape. So this is a great example of how to correct this type of issue in the firmware. And that's all fine and good for Prusa with their firmware and their hardware setup, but what about Log here, who just runs regular old Marlin, and the frame on it might not be all that square at the top. What do we do then? Well, Marlin's got you covered. So right now, Log is running an SKR 1.3 board, and it only has one plug for a Z driver. And I only have four drivers installed. So what I do is run one of these breakout boards. I plug this one into my Z, right there, and then both my Z motors go on this board. They're hooked up in series, so they do the exact same thing at the same time. And even in this configuration, though I can't control the Z motors independently, there are still firmware options that help you line that Z up if you need to. So for this first configuration, basically we're going to mirror what Prusa does. Now you don't need smart drivers necessarily. You can use anything without sensorless homing, but it is very useful to have something where you can adjust the current via the software. If you use something like an A4988 or an 8825, that could cause crashing when you really need to be kind of gentle when you're going to the top of your Z axis to get everything lined up. So I recommend using something like a 2208, 2209. There's a lot of different ones out there that you can control the current but it can be done with the simpler drivers. So just to show you here, I have only four drivers enabled. Remember, my Z motors are sharing the Z driver. We're gonna enable them as 2208s. 228 does not have sensorless homing. 
Then we're going to go to configuration underscore ADV.h. And we're going to enable mechanical gantry calibration. This is essentially the same thing that Perusha does. You can adjust the current with this feature for when it does that calibration. I usually run it 800, so I'm going to run it 400, that's half, for the calibration. Extra Z height, so when you set your height of the printer in the Marlin configuration, mine is set at 200, that gives the maximum that it's going to travel to do this calibration, and then this is the amount that it does over that. So it just does it for 15 more millimeters to make sure everything is nice and flat at the top. It's all the way up on both of those holders. This is what it does so you don't have to have sensorless homing. And then you can set the feed rate that it uses to move during the calibration. You can also flip it if you have a printer that needs to do this in the minimum direction instead of max. If you have a setup where it will be aligned that way, you can flip it around. You can adjust the safe position, so when it does this calibration, if you needed to move your nozzle out of the way for some reason, you can do that here. You can adjust the park feed rate, so when it's done with the calibration, how fast does it return to home or wherever it's going to go. You can set pre-calibration commands if you wish, and post-calibration commands, and by default G28 just to home it again. I leave that in there because it's nice to have it bring it all the way back down to zero, so you're ready to start printing. So we'll enable this, and we'll go ahead and flash it to the printer. And then all you need to do to run that process is enter a G34, and that's going to start bringing that gantry all the way to the top. And just like the Prusa configuration, the printer's going to home, then it's going to take the Z all the way to the top, it's going to bottom out on these two top brackets, and then bring it all the way back down to home. So this process is going to get your gantry leveled out by squaring it with the top of the frame. And that's going to be pretty useful if you're powering it off and powering it on because you could actually lose some steps by the gantry falling a bit. But these machines also have motor current timeout. So your motors don't stay energized all the time. So when that happens, you could still lose a couple of steps because you can backfeed these lead screws. And you don't want to have to do that level process every time you print. But there's a setting to help with that as well. And that can be adjusted in configuration underscore ADV.h in Marlin in idle step or shutdown. So by default, deactivate time is 120 seconds. And for most motors, that's going to be fine. But to keep it from falling in the Z, you can set this one to false, which I've done here. And if you have a smart driver, this idle current can be brought down quite a bit. In the has trinamic configuration, the first line here is hold multiplier. I set mine to 0.3, so it's going to hold it at 30% of current of what it normally would be. My Z current is currently set to 800. So after that setting's enabled, after you've moved your Z ones after first boot up, then you will never lose that holding current. They'll always have just a little bit to keep it from falling and ruining the next print if you're a person that doesn't shut their printer off from use to use. So that can help you keep Z synchronized. So that is a really nice feature, being able to level up on here. And you don't have to have the most smart driver. You could do it with a 2208. You don't necessarily have to have sensorless homing. And you don't have to have a Z probe to use it. But what if your printer is like mine here? Log isn't necessarily all that square. I did cut the frame out of a piece of wood. These two holders might not be the same distance as each other. So you can't level very well across the gantry. Well, if you do have a Z-probe, there's a way around this. And for this next scenario, you will need two Z drivers. So we're going to use one in Z and one in E1. And this is pretty much the biggest question that I get. How do I set up this configuration to work correctly? And they will work independently, so we can use this feature that I'm getting ready to show you. So let's get all that set up now. So this is the configuration that we're going to use for this setup. It is again a 1.3 board. We're going to use separate drivers on separate Z motors. And just play like all these drivers are all the same type. This one's actually a 2209 and these are 2130s. But you don't need sensorless homing for this configuration. You can use a 2208, but again, recommend something that you can set the current on the fly no matter what it is. But you can do that on a lot of drivers. They don't necessarily have to have stall guard or all the fancy things Trinamics have. But we're going to have one Z motor plugged in here for Z, and the other one is going to be plugged in to E1. 
Separate drivers, we can control them separately. Also, just note that it doesn't matter which motor goes where. It doesn't matter if you use the left or right Z on Z or E1. You can flip them around, it's not going to care. Now back to Marlin, configuration.h. You can select whichever driver you have here, but we're going to use all 2209s. Again, sensorless homing doesn't matter. But we've got four, X, Y, Z, and E0, and then we're going to use that other extruder driver for Z2. So you don't want to use it on E1 down here. You want to actually call it Z2, what we're going to use it as. So that will enable the fifth driver. Now we need to set up the configuration. So configuration underscore ADV dot H. We are going to comment out the mechanical gantry calibration that we showed earlier because you can't use this method and this one on the same machine. You have to pick one or the other. And then at the top of the file, there's a whole section about dual steppers, dual end stops. You can use them on X, Y, or Z. And we are going to uncomment the section for multiple Z drivers, and then we're going to set it to two. This is automatically going to select that E1 driver. You can change that up in your pins file if you wish, but this is also the section where you would set up multiple end stops. So if you take the comment off of this line right here, you can set up that same scenario that the AnyCubic printer has. And just to show it one more time, that's the scenario where we have multiple end stops. We've got one over here, and then one over on this side. When it homes, it hits them both, waits for them to trigger, and then it knows that the gantry is level. If those end stops are level, not every configuration is going to work like that. But this is where we'd set that up. And by default on these boards, it's going to call X max for that second end stop, if you would like. Now, we usually use this for like filament detect, these pins right here. But the configuration of Marlin is going to default to these pins most of the time. So that's where you would plug in your second end stop. First one, second one. Again, it doesn't matter which one is which, which side goes to which end stop. But I would pair them up with the motor cable, left and right, just to make sure you don't get confused. It's just easier to figure things out that way. So that's how you use multiple end stops. We're not going to do that in this video, but it's there if you need it. So we're just going for two motor drivers, two motors, so they're independent. But then we're going to jump to Z-Steppers Auto Align. This is the feature that can help you out with this. We'll just take the comment off of Z-Steppers Auto Align. And then it gives you an explanation of what it's going to do. You can use multiple Z motors, two, three, or four, to achieve the same thing. RepRap firmware does this as well. Down here on Z Stepper Align X and Y, you can set the points where you would do this alignment at. On this Mark 42 bed, I do have specific probe points, so I have set their location. This is the first probe point, 27107. This is the second probe point, 229.5107. You'll see that on the bed here in a moment when we run it. But then it's going to give you a little map of the orientation of where it's going to take those probes, depending on what setting you select. We are going to run in the zero position with two steppers, so that's one and two, left and right. That is set right here. If you'd like to use other spots, you just change this number according to your map. And you can get pretty involved with one of these if you have multiple stepper motors. This down here requires three motors, but now you're getting closer to that true level like RepRap does. You can actually adjust the tilt of the bed before you even build a mesh grid, which is pretty accurate. But you set all the motors placements and alignments where they're going to probe. You can set the grid size. You can set the maximum grade. So if it sees something that's too far out of whack, it'll stop and throw an error. Alignment iterations. I just leave it at five. Five seems to be able to work it out pretty well. You'll see that more in a minute. But you can also select what it happens after it does this. It's going to allow you to restore your mesh leveling grid if you want to. That's what this line does. I just leave that intact because it really doesn't have anything to do with leveling. And you can also home after the G34 command, which again is always best practice. And this works pretty well with that motor current setting because we want to hold current on those motors so it doesn't fall while the printer's on. Now, you might have to run the G34 every time you boot, depending on how loose your Z motors might be. You could lose some steps. And while we're talking about motor current, it's probably important to mention anytime you're using dual drivers on one axis, like you are here on Z, you want to make sure the motor current is as close as possible on both motors. Let's take a look at the TMC section one more time. 
This is the has trinamic configuration like we're going to be using on these drivers. This will be enabled. But you can see the current for X. You can also run an M906 command if you'd like to look at these. But this current, and if you lower the current when homing, make sure that both the motors, in this case the Z motors, are set the same. And you can see Z and Z2 here are both set to 800. Now there are some considerations to make when you're setting these up in series. If you're running two motors, you might have to up the current a bit. And if you separate those motors out into two different drivers, you might want to consider lowering the current a bit. It's all based on what driver you're using and what motor you're using. But no matter if you're using a smart driver, like here where you can set it in the software, or you're using something like an A4988 where you have to set it with the trim pot, make sure you get that current as close as you can on both motors. That's just going to save you from a lot of troubleshooting going forward, because if one's a little lower than the other, you might have one that's missing some steps because it's skipping, or something like that. It's just going to be a lot easier if you get them close. Now with that configuration uploaded, if we get into Pronterface, we can run some commands. Always I recommend you reset EEPROM when you're doing anything like this, no matter what changes you make. So M502, then M500. But now when we run that G34 command, it's going to probe multiple points and test to see how level that gantry might be. So we'll go ahead and run it. It's going to home the printer and then start taking the test probes. So we're going to test the one on the left. Then we'll go over and test the one on the right, and it's going to make the lead screw adjustments on the fly to each motor. And it's not really all that noticeable if it's not very far out, but it does a really good job, and it also outputs to the terminal if you need to see what it's doing. You can see the different iterations that it's going to run. This one does five, you saw that in the firmware, and then how far those were out in between both of those motors. And it should be able to bring it down every time that it runs. So we got all the way from a 3.89 on our second iteration down to a 0.38. And it can get even more accurate than that. Now I'm going to shut the printer off and I want to skew the X quite a bit so you can see this thing in action. I'm going to pull this side up quite a bit. And then I'm just going to let this run so you can watch it. We'll speed it up a bit. But you can see that it's making adjustments to both motors as it probes. So we'll just fire up that G34 one more time. So now that it's complete and we're back home, we can take a look at the terminal. And you can see we kind of started out high, 2.23. We went even higher because as it's trying to level that out, it's making changes. But after five iterations, we were able to get down to a 0.34, which is pretty good, but it could be better. Also note that these commands are available. You can run this process from the LCD and it will spit out your difference right here on the screen. Back to the terminal. The more points you run, the more accurate it becomes. So if we just run this again, the G34, you will see that it's able to dial it in even further. And at this point, essentially, we have had 10 iterations, and we were able to get it down to a 0.01. Can't ask for any better than that. So if you have a printer that might be really far out, or you have a really long X gantry, you might want to consider upping those iterations. This default stepper deactivate time is going to be useful as well. Because after you run that G34, after you've booted up, you can enable this and it will always keep that current on the motors so you don't have to run it again. You just have to worry about that after you boot up. So if you keep your printer on a lot, again, this might be more useful. So if you're concerned about your Z motors losing sync, you might want to consider running one of these processes every time you boot the printer. Now that we have some holding current on the Z motors, this shouldn't be an issue unless you power the machine off. But there is one more feature I wanted to show you that you could consider that will automatically do this every time you boot up. And it could be handy for a lot of processes. And that's this feature right here, Startup Commands. And I want to thank Mr. Latin for making me aware that this feature was available, but anything you put in between these quotes will run at startup.
So we're just going to enter the G34 command to do that gantry leveling sequence. Now you want to be careful what commands you use as a startup command, because things could go wrong. You need to make sure your printer is working as you expect it to. Because let's say something like your bed leveling probe didn't work and you use it to Z home, it's automatically going to run this G34 no matter what when this printer boots. So if that probe didn't work, it would dive the head right into the bed and cause problems. So be very selective about what commands you'd like to use as startup commands. But if the ultimate goal is to keep your gantry as level as possible, this might be one to consider. So just put your command in here and go ahead and upload it again to the printer. And now every time we boot up, the G34 will take over, it'll home, and start to run that calibration sequence. And if that power on option isn't the one for you, you don't want to run those at startup every time, do note on this feature where it's trying to level multiple spots for your gantry, if it senses that it's already accurate within a certain amount, like mine is at 0.01, .01 it'll only run it one time. So that gives you a better chance of running it in the start G code where it won't be so annoying. So keep that in mind. So there it is, a handful of options you have for your Z-axis for when you're planning your next 3D printer build or your next upgrade. And the features that are available in Marlin help to keep it consistent and they can be used on any 3D printer board. So hopefully this was helpful information for you. That's all I have for today and I will see you very soon on the next one.